Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of video series dedicated to learning Microsoft Fabric. My name is Fikrat. In one of the previous discussions related to Microsoft Fabric's uh, lake house, um, I mentioned that the first data zone that uh, receives your data in the lake houses, uh, so that's a bronze zone if we follow the medallion uh, architecture terms. So in the bronze zone, the table structures usually mimic the data source structures. In ideal world, the table structure design in bronze uh, should be good throughout, throughout your project. Uh, however, in reality, the data sources often come with uh, some irregularities like incorrect schema or corrupt values that don't fit the expected target schema. Uh, in addition, uh, you should also expect some permanent structure changes like uh, added, removed columns uh, from data source side. How to handle these irregularities and permanent change? Should you design bronze table with rigid structure or make them flexible, allowing to evolve over the time? Today we will explore different ways of handling data source irregularities in uh, Microsoft Fabric Spark Notebooks and learn how to create flexible table structures adapting to your changing data sources. Let's get started. Here is a quick preview of what we are going to discuss today. Uh, our first topic will be schema enforcement on read. So we'll first explore a default behavior of Spark when reading from flat files. So Spark applies schema enforcement on your data. However, there is a way of to disable the schema enforcement, which could be useful in some uh, use cases. Next, we're going to explore how Spark handles corrupt values in CSV and JSON files. When I say corrupt, I mean the values that do not comply with the expected target schema. So we will first learn default processing behavior. Then we'll consider alternative processing options that you can see on the screen. Our next big topic is going to be schema enforcement on the right. In other words, we'll try to understand what happens when you uh, try to write your data frame in the lake house tables when there are some differences between your source and destination schemas. So we'll first explore default behavior. We'll see what happens when you try to write less number of columns to your target table or more number of columns to your target table. And then we'll talk about schema evolution options. Uh, in some cases, it makes sense to make your table structure flexible uh, to allow so-called schema evolution. In other words, schema evolution means um, allow your table structures to adapt to ever-changing source data schema. A quick reminder before we proceed, uh, if you are new to the channel, please take a moment and subscribe. Um, thanks in advance. And let's get started. For this demo, I'm going to use two artifacts, um, source files and uh, the Spark notebooks that you can see on the screen. Uh, both of them will be shared in the video description so that you could repeat this experiment. So let me show you source files. These are uh, open source sales data. Uh, for different months and I have tweaked uh, each of them to introduce some uh, irregularities. So let's start with uh, January and uh, uh, February data which has similar uh, structure with date, country, units and revenue columns in it. And if I take a look at March data we had only three columns. So revenue columns is missing and my April data has four columns however the uh, last column name is slightly different finally May data comes with completely different column names so 
please go ahead and upload these files on the unmanaged section of your lake house. So in my case, I have created CSV and schema enforcement folders. Uh, whatever folder you upload the files to, so don't forget to take a relative path and put in the first cell. And now let me walk you through this notebook. So my first command reads from this folder, which contains all the CSV files. Um, notice that I have specified schema and it's, it's best practice to include your schema. Uh, so first of all, it may be required when you don't have column headers for file types like CSV. Um, and second, it's also advisable from performance perspective. So reading from files for which you have specified schemas are always a little faster. Okay, so let's take a look at the data. So we can see the sales date, country, units, and revenue. So all of my data uh, has been read into DF data frame successfully. Even though we had differences, Spark has enforced all of this data into the same schema. Now let's apply filters to see how Spark has processed different periods of this data. So here's my March data. Because it was missing revenue columns, Spark has filled it with null values. My next command applies filter for April data. And here the data looks good, even though my last column had a different column name. Similarly, if we take a look at May data, which had all columns with irregular names, the data comes with uh, correct column names. The default schema enforcement is a great option for most use cases, but in some cases you might want to disable this uh, to understand which files comply or don't comply with expected schemas. So to do that, you can use enforce schema option. By default, if you don't specify, Spark assumes that it's set to true. Uh, however, you can explicitly set it to false, in which case your read command will fail uh, when encounter the first file which do not comply with expected uh, schema. Good thing is that you can find out which files uh, have failed this enforcement. So if I scroll down, we can find uh, specifics of this failure. Okay, my next demo will be to explore corrupt values handling with Spark. And when I say corrupt, I mean data that do not comply with the expected schema. So let me show you the example of such uh, corrupt data. So if I switch to my uh, CSV files, I have June sales data uh, where I have four columns. Uh, but as you can see, for sales date column, I have predominantly date type uh, data, uh, except in few rows, I have string data, which cannot be converted to date. Uh, similarly, for units, column I have mostly integer data and I have few string data among them. So if I scroll down, my next command specifies a schema where I say sales data is going to be date type and a units column is going to be integer. And if I read June data where I had some corrupt values, so this is what I will get. The rows that had irregular data were still successfully read into the data frame. However, this particular columns uh, that had the corrupt values uh, have been filled with null values. So the default processing behavior that we just observed uh, is convenient and good for most use cases. However, downside of this option is that it might be hard to differentiate rows which have corrupt values from the rows which comes with empty values. So uh, to address this kind of scenarios, we have three 
mode options with Spark data read commands. So if I scroll down, my first command use permissive mode. And with this option, I get extra column, which includes all the values for the rows, which have irregular data. Uh, for permissive option to work properly, you have to do a couple of additional things. So first of all, you have to include extra column, which should include irregular values. And then you have to specify these column names in column name of corrupt record uh, option so that Spark knows where to put all this data. Now let's take a look at another option called drop malformed mode. So with this option, Spark skips all of the rows with corrupt values uh, and reads remaining rows. So if I scroll down, I can no longer see the rows where I had incorrect values like Panama, so for example. The third processing option when it comes to corrupt values is called fail fast. With this option, Spark will fail when it comes across any rows that do not comply with the expected schema. Okay, now that we know how Spark handles uh, irregularities during reads, let's take a look at what happens when you are trying to write your data frame to uh, delta tables. My next command reads January data and then writes two columns, uh, sales date and the counter columns in the sales SE table. My next command creates a data frame with single column and it tries to write into the same table. So in other words, we are writing single column data frame into two columns table. And as you can see, the command has succeeded. Uh, so let's take a look at the data. So if I scroll down uh, here, uh, the data that was inserted on the first right, and this row represents the second right where the count columns was filled with null values. Now let's see what happens when you are trying to write more columns into your target table. So in this case, we are trying to write three columns into two column uh, Delta Lake table. Uh, as you can see, the command fails by default. So to summarize, Spark is quite strict when it comes to writing into Delta table. It always ensures that new data comply with your target table structure. However, there are some cases when you would want to deliberately allow the data that comes with different schema into your target table. So this is also called schema evolution. And uh, to achieve that, you can set merge schema option to true when you are writing to the table. With merge schema option set to true, so my data frame with three columns uh, can write successfully to two column table and if I scroll down, this is the extra column and the rows that have existed before uh, will be filled with null values. So if I scroll down, we'll, we'll be able to see the rows that pre-existed. Merge schema option works on individual table level. So, so you can turn on and off uh, this option for any given data frame. However, in some cases, you would like to uh, turn on this option for all rights. So uh, to do that, you can use this configuration settings. Uh, by default, it's set to false. However, if you turn it to true using uh, Spark Conf set command, then all your rights will become flexible without specify auto merge options. So as you can see, my next command skips option clause. However, it still succeeds. That concludes today's discussion. To summarize, default Spark schema enforcement uh, either converts the source data into the target table structure when the differences are minimal, 
or fails the execution. Uh, however, you can always change this behavior in a few ways. Uh, by tweaking read API options, uh, you can either lock irregularities, skip problematic roles, or fail the execution. And the approach will depend of, on the nature of your data and the business requirements. You can also make your data structure flexible, adapting to the change in the source, which will reduce execution failures. There are arguments in favor of both rigid and evolved schema options. The rigid schema ensures that your team is immediately informed about uh, irregularities and schema changes at the cost of failed pipelines. On the other hand, a low schema evolution will reduce ETL pipeline failures uh, at the risk of schema changes being unnoticed by your team. I hope this discussion was informative and helpful for you. Thanks for watching and I will see you in future videos.